Welcome to Corwin's Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast with host Peter DeWitt. This podcast is from education leaders for education leaders. Every week, Peter and our guests get together to share ideas, put research into practice, and ensure every student is learning, not by chance, but by design. Hi, Peter. Hey, Tanya. How are you? Good. I like black on you, for those of you who can see this. Oh, thank you. Yes. I, uh, I, yeah, you know. Well, Johnny it's flattering. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, <laughs> there's a reason why it's a classic. It just it's flattering. <laughs> it is. It was just I, I was kind of like this is the this is the shirt I want to wear. It's a beautiful day in upstate New York for sure. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty nice here too. So we are together learning again. I'm excited as always, and today's guest does not disappoint. We have on Jennifer Jennifer Spencer Imes. Yes. Um, who has written a book with her co-author i believe it's josh is it flosey i think she says his exact pronunciation during the 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 show itself so listeners if you want to get that exact you'll hear it but she's recently they recently recent uh read uh written a book called uh, leading for all how to create truly inclusive and excellent schools she is currently a superintendent a very active superintendent uh, for students in oregon and she She's led significant transformation in her district in uh, a full inclusion model. And so that's what today's conversation is all about, is to how to really move to a full inclusion model. Uh, She is a a large district that's going to come out. She's got 10,000 kids. And so she really has some insights on how to get districts moving in 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 that direction. And what I really liked about this conversation that listeners are going to hear is I won't talk about the little changes that she shares. You can hear them when you when you listen for yourself. But man, isn't it true that little little changes can spark really big things to happen, that it's not always major initiatives that have to be rolled out, that it's just asking why and questioning longstanding practices um, that can be really, um, really monumental in what happens in children's lives. Well, I feel like you and I have talked almost every episode about, wow, this was a really amazing guest. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, you know, there were so many things that I needed to lean into here because as I, you know, I taught inclusion for seven out of 11 years. I was school principal. Mm-hmm. And so she tapped into some things that are just those issues that I still see that are that are amazing and she talks about segregated classroom and that is very very strong language but one of the things that i want people to hear uh, that i want to point out is on the positive side yeah. i want them to hear how jennifer actually practiced self awareness and i'll talk you know i talk about it in the interview with her but i love how she she actually told us about some stories that actually brought about self-awareness for her. That's yeah. really, yeah. as you know, you know, Tanya, that's a big topic for me right now. Yeah. But it's just important to say, wow, you have these, you might have these beliefs, but you had this level of self-awareness that happened through conversations. And then the second one is questioning practices. Mm-hmm. She said, you know, we started to question our practices. That is so important because sadly, not everybody does question the practices so those two things alone within the interview I loved but just tapping into how can we get inclusion right and why is it in this day of constant conversations about equity and inclusion we don't talk about self-contained classrooms and that's something that she is going to that's something she focuses on it as well so this was to me, this was just such a fantastic interview to be able to do. I really, really appreciated her insight. Yeah, I think it rounds out nicely um, all of the topics that we've covered. Um, I think leaders are going to find, a, uh, listeners are going to find a lot when they, when they, when they hear this episode. So, enjoy everyone, uh, and we will see you on the other side. Come explore Corwin's free new teacher toolkit and resources. We've curated these resources based on extensive research from teachers, coaches, and principals alike. Whether you are brand new or a veteran teacher, find ready to go teaching tools at corwin.com today. Jennifer Spencer Himes, welcome to the Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast. Thanks, Peter. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, it's really nice to meet you. And, uh, 
So you have written a book. Actually, I want to talk a little bit more about just the process of writing the book, because this is your first book. Absolutely. First and only so far. Uh, well, don't say first and only. You never know. <laughs> but, so it's called Leading for All, How to Create Truly Inclusive and Excellent Schools. And the first thing I, I do want to ask you, because we have people that you know are listening that are school leaders and they're like, wow, she's a practicing assistant superintendent and she wrote a book. Talk to us a little bit about um, where the book came from in the first place. Yeah, thanks for asking that. We um, we started this journey um, about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, and a pretty traditional uh, school district in terms of our approach to students with disabilities in special education. We had a lot of wonderful things in place and we were a pretty well-regarded school district in terms of outcomes for students, a lot of um, high achieving things, a lot of opportunities, a lot of um, things that were in place for students. But in terms of students with disabilities, we were pretty what you might call traditional where students with mild to moderate disabilities, we had a resource level of support in every school, but students who had more complex learning needs, um, we did some sorting and areas of expertise at different schools and said, my goodness, if this student needs more uh, services related to quote unquote life skills, uh, maybe we're going to bust them over to this school if they have more needs in related to autism. Uh, we're going to bust them over to this school into, um, let's let's say, it, honestly segregated classrooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, we began to feel very uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. uh, we delved into the research and found, in fact, there's no research supporting that as an educational practice. Mm -hmm. and, and yet we have continued to do it because... I don't know why we're we're very comfortable with that in our in our school system. It's hard to hard to change embedded systems yeah. um, that value expertise. I understand that. I used to teach a self-contained classroom once upon a time, and I did good work. And I our teachers that were doing that did good work too. They worked hard to care for kids and um, help try to meet their learning needs. And yet the research continues to tell us that students in inclusive classrooms. Um, have better academic outcomes, have better social outcomes, have better independence and post high school outcomes. So why do we continue to do this? So after we raised that question, um, it, we began to make the changes to align our practices to our beliefs. And um, it was, a, you know, it's a process. It wasn't instantaneous. And there were a lot of moves that we made along the way. And as we settled into this new reality, many people would come and visit us or ask us, what were those moves you made as a district to make this um, on a district-wide level? And I found there were a lot of books out there about instructional practices for inclusion um, or school-wide change, but I didn't find any about district-wide change. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, well, let's let's write it down. <laughs> First mm -hmm. of all, I'm uh, just a uh, a leadership exercise of reflection. What did we do? Um, let's make sure that we're clear about what were the practices that led to change over time. And um, so we wrote those down without really knowing uh, if anyone would would publish that book or be interested in, would it be of use to anyone else? Um, but figured even just the act of reflection would be good for us, um, wrote it down, and then um, found that, in fact, it has been useful for other folks to um, use that to prompt their own thinking about district-wide change. Well, that's great because, you know, people need to learn vicarious experiences. They need to learn from other practitioners who are doing the work. How, how large is your district? We are about, well, we were about 10,000. We've been between nine and 10,000. Pandemic okay. has shifted us up and down a little bit. But that's a big, that's a big district. There are lots, uh, that, that's, a, that's a good size for sure. What we like to do on Leaders Coaching Leaders is define, just to have a common language and a common understanding because we find that there are a lot of words that are used like growth mindset and differentiated instruction. And yet people just have various understandings of what that is. 
one of the words that you use in your book, is, in the title of your book, is inclus inclusive. So what is inclusion? When you're talking about inclusion, what is inclusion? Yes, thank you for asking that. And um, I mean several things by inclusion. First of all, I mean it broadly and generally um, in terms of inclusion as a space of belonging for all students. Um, I mean it in terms of race, in terms of language, in terms of uh, gender, nationality. How are we creating learning spaces where every student belongs, where every student feels representation? Um, that is that is the broad sense of inclusion that we are working for in terms of our equity work, in terms of um, our language, world language programs, those sorts of things, which are all intertwined. But we also mean it very specifically around special education, mm -hmm. because somehow in the leadership work around equity, I have known so many leaders who are deeply committed to equity. And yet they maintain segregated classrooms for students with disabilities, sometimes without even asking why. Mm -hmm. um, maybe because as a broader educational system, we have kind of separated the um, ownership and expertise around special education from the ownership and expertise um, for all of their students. And even at the district office level, you can still find places where, um, you know, who, who is overseeing the, the supports and learning for students with most significant needs may be completely different than who's supporting teaching and learning in general. And that, of course, is going to lead to kind of siloized um, uh, models of instructional practice. So one of the things we have learned is we, we have to, um, inclusion starts with us being inclusive in how we plan at the district level, how we um, think about our professional development, how we think about our hiring. So when we think about inclusion, I mean it broadly and I mean it specifically that um, all students are at their neighborhood school in, in our district. All students have a place and belonging in the general education classroom. That doesn't mean that every student's schedule is exactly the same because every uh, students have individualized plans and individualized needs. And so, of course, there is still an IEP system, system and program that may be developed for a student where um, they may have an individualized plan that create something different for them for a period of time, uh, for a process. They may feel overwhelmed in a large classroom without some time outside of the classroom and then back in. But um, the assumption is always that the, um, the belonging is in the classroom and that it is our job to create the access points in that classroom as opposed to well, this isn't working for them. Let's create something different. So that's that's what we mean by inclusion. And thank you, thank you for that. Because it, so, just so you know, uh, inclusion is near and dear to my heart because I taught for eleven years, and I taught inclusion for seven out of those eleven years. And back when I started teaching inclusion, I don't mind aging myself, but it was nineteen ninety seven. I was asked to teach inclusion, and back then the special ed teacher would come and pick the kids up from the classroom and pull them out to the hallway. There wasn't even a self-contained classroom at the school where I was teaching. So when I was asked to teach inclusion, the special ed teacher had come to see me during the summer and she had asked, you know, let's put a schedule together and, you know, when she could pull the kids out. And I said, no, we're going to co-teach. We're co-teaching together. And it was a fantastic experience for me because I just, like they're all of our kids, right? They're not just, those are my kids and those are your kids. And when we did inclusion together, it was, we co-planned, we co-taught. Uh, there were some parents who didn't know who the general education teacher and the special ed teacher was. They did, didn't necessarily know those things. I say that because sadly, I went to another school where once again, I was going to be teaching inclusion, had to have the same conversation with a special ed teacher. It ended up becoming more of the co-teaching. And 
But what I have found even to this day in 2023, special ed teachers are very expensive finger pointers where they go in and just keep the child on task and inclusion is, and kids are still pulled out into the hallway. And part of, you know, John Hattie's research really focuses on well over 350 influences and inclusion is one of them. And it has a very low effect size. We're talking like under 0 0.20. And one of the things that happens is people see them, they're like, see, we should just get rid of inclusion. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying that people are still doing inclusion wrong <laughs> and they need to know how to do it correctly. And that's why I really enjoy like what I heard I was going to be talking to you. I was very excited because you're somebody that is doing it right, Ooh. right? Your school district is doing it right. And I know it takes, a, it takes a team to be able to do that, especially when you're looking at it from a district standpoint with nine to 10,000 students. So what led you to saying, we need to do this differently? And what are some simple, maybe that's not the best word, but what are some simple steps people need to be able to take? Because you said it, there's a stigma. I mean, I write for Education Week. I've written blogs on special ed teachers are being treated like second class citizens. Um, so see, you got me on my soapbox and this isn't good for moderating you know, a, a podcast, but I just, the inclusion topic is so interesting to me because what you're really talking about is let's treat all kids like humans. And so what led you to that decision? And then what are some steps people need to be able to take to get there? And they don't need large steps, right? We don't, we, but what are some small steps they can take to get there? Well, first of all, I already knew I liked you. And now <laughs> I'm all in because I'm so excited about your passion um, in this area as well, because, uh, you know, one of the things we continue to say is once once your blinders are pulled off, you, you, mm -hmm. you can't go back and, and see it right. in a different way. Once you see all kids as, 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 as human and belonging, you think, why did we do it this other way? Um, so let's how so you asked a couple things what <laughs> i did, did i asked a lot <laughs> <laughs> how did we get here and then what are a couple simple steps to to start moving this work forward um so how did we get here there are personal simple stories are, are really um personal powerful stories i'm going to tell you one story that uh, occurred right when i was first hired so i had been um, a general education teacher I taught in a school where we just had natural inclusion. It just, mm -hmm. it, it was just the way we did things. And so that was early on in my career. I had the, the pr great privilege of having a student, a student highly impacted by autism in my classroom. Um, just, and I got very curious about how do I do a better job meeting his needs? Cause I felt a little, uh, I didn't have all the skills that I wanted, but he was definitely part of the class. And that is what inspired me to go back and get my special education endorsement and, and learn a lot more. Um, and But then uh, later on, um, when I came to this district, one of the first things I did was meet with parents. And um, so in the, you know, you get hired as an administrator, you go around immediately, who are all the stakeholders you meet with? You meet with staff and parents and teachers and administrators and just, you know, just trying to listen, listen, listen. And uh, one of the parents who I met with early on, who's a dear, dear friend of mine right now, she had a child who was going into kindergarten, a child with Down syndrome. And she was a strong advocate. She said, I, my child is going to be included in kindergarten. And we still had self-contained classrooms at that time. And I said, I support you. Yes, let's do this. So she was, she started out included in kindergarten. And yet we didn't have the infrastructure and the mindsets and beliefs in place yet. Um, and it didn't go well. And um, partway through that year, there were some safety concerns and some things where we ended up having a very difficult meeting mm -hmm. where we said, for safety reasons, we're going to need to have her move to another school, not her neighborhood school that she was invested in and her family was connected to. We were going to bus her somewhere else. 
and this parent was sick about it and she thought about suing us mm -hmm. um and she would have you know now i feel like rightly so but what happened in that meeting is she and i cried together mm -hmm. i felt the grief too and i said you're right i don't have it we don't have it in place to keep your daughter safe and have her learning needs needs met yet but i promise you we're going to change things in this district so that we will mm -hmm. and you and i are going to be on this journey together and it was it was a powerful moment for both of us and she has continued to be a an ally and a confidant and an advisor to me along with many other parents throughout this journey to hear what it feels like from a parent's perspective so there's moments like that that you're like of course we have i can't i can't let that parent down i can't let that student down why shouldn't she be able to be included in her school? Um, she's happily included in high school now um, and a very, uh, very much a part of um, our her neighborhood high school. And we cannot imagine high school without her. She's quite a, an, a, a member of that school right now. So those were some of the early things. We started with um, sharing the research and then sharing those kinds of stories, but also um, documentaries, films, mm -hmm. um, Dan Habib's work, um, including Samuel, mm -hmm. uh, Intelligent Lives. Uh, again, those those stories that really help people see uh, what it um, what it looks like, what it feels like. Why do we have the, the this ableism cap on what we think mm -hmm. um, people can do that uh, limits? the sense of, oh, well, they'll never learn X, mm -hmm. um, which we are um, proven wrong again and again when we give students the opportunity. So we start, we show those to different stakeholders, community screenings, um, screenings with our school board, had our school board retreat, um, because when you're going to make systemic change, it's not just your special ed department or your teaching and learning department. Your whole community needs to get involved. We rented out uh, movie theaters and showed Intelligent Lives as a community um, and invited uh, community, our rotary clubs, our city councils um, to be a part of that as well. So that's um, really putting out our identity as, as this is who we are. We are inclusive and we are excellent. And that's the other thing is that um, one of the graphs that we show, one of the data points we show in the school, the um, book, and one of the reasons why John Hattie always says, don't take just one of his mm -hmm. uh, points out without thinking about the whole, mm -hmm. is that as we've done this work, our graduation rates for students with disabilities have increased significantly, but so have our graduation rates for all students and the gaps between those two groups have, have gotten smaller, which is the goal of education, right? It's the impact. Yes. Yeah, it's it's the impact for yes. sure. Yes. So one it's a couple what you asked what were a couple of the early steps that you so not only the building belief and understanding, but then what do you do? So one of the very early things we did was change how you take attendance. So in year one. Um, so we still had a segregated classrooms, but each classroom, um, the, each child in one of those segregated classrooms, well, first thing we did was change our language. We mm -hmm. changed it from calling a self-contained classroom or a program classroom to a segregated classroom. Mm -hmm. That kind of holds you accountable right there. Well, you just helped me with my next question, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we changed attendance. So instead of the special education teacher, um, being the sole owner of those students, and then the, those students occasionally visiting a general ed classroom through like a quote unquote little mainstream opportunity, even if they mostly still were in that segregated classroom, we changed attendance to that general ed classroom that they were um, in some of the time and said, okay, that's now their, that's their classroom even if most of the time they were still in the special ed classroom, but we changed attendance. And that did that was amazing. It started to change ownership. Yeah. Um, first of all, it changed communication because now the general ed teacher was 
tasked with filling out the report card. And they said, wait a minute, I don't really know this student. Well, I guess we better get to know each other, that student. And those opportunities for co-teaching, co-planning really began to um, see a need for that. And that began to emerge more. Um, those opportunities for things like being just included in the book orders and the class parties and the just all the things that happen in a day um, increased when the students were on that case list or on that class list as well. So changing attendance was a very small thing, but it was a huge thing in beginning to make that shift. Um, so that was that was one one early move that we made. I think well I think there are two things you talked about and and you know that those small shifts can create huge shifts, right? Overall, yeah, people need to remember with John's research that one, their meta-analysis, which means that their that effect size is an average effect size. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work well everywhere. It's It works well over here. It might not work well. And we have to understand why, because also with Hattie's research, and he will tell you, is that it's it's it shows us how it's worked so far. It's not showing us how it's going to work in the future. We need to use those those that those pieces of research as a cautionary tale for how we can move forward. One of the things that you've you've talked about, and it's a very strong word. Like when I segregated, that's a that's a strong word. So why did you start to call it segregated? Was it because you wanted people to understand what they were really doing? Um, because that is a very strong word that I haven't heard used when it comes to um, self-contained classrooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's simultaneous to the work that we've been doing here. I was attending different um, workshops. Again, I'm a, I'm a working yeah, administrator, yeah. so we're we're in all the conversations, and so of course we're thinking about racial equity and mm -hmm. um, conversations, and so we're thinking about the power of language and um in that as well and there was a went to a workshop about um microaggressions and and language and thinking about that and we just started really wondering about how how um our language use in this was um you know who is it benefiting to kind of soften um the construct of putting just students with disabilities together in one classroom. Um, it, what's the benefit of softening that language or being, um, and what's the advantage of being more assertive with that language? And so, um, you know, when you're trying to make change um, and you're trying to help bring attention to we really want to question why this has always been this way, then that is a, a really appropriate time to think about how our language can um, help us question that. So that it, it has been intentional, um, an intentional use of that shift for us. I think one of the, you know, one of the powerful things that you said earlier too, and it's something that I definitely see time and time again is we the ableism but we also create this glass ceiling for kids to be able to say oh well they struggle or oh they're not going to do that well in school and that drives me crazy as a guy that barely graduated from high school and was retained in elementary school it drives me even more crazy but you know one of the things that i wonder about you had talked about the whole idea of equity and inclusion are big con conversations they really are you know, when you're thinking about equity and inclusion, why is it that segregated classrooms still exist, even when we're trying to talk so much about equity? It almost seems, it seems like they're purposely left out, it, it, that special ed students are purposely left out of the equity conversation. So why is it that you think and I realize I'm asking you for your opinion on this, but you lived it, you know, as a as a practitioner. In this day and age of equity and inclusion, why is it that segregated classrooms and self-contained classrooms still exist and we're not talking much about it? 
I, I think that is just a fantastic question to ask. And um, it, it flummoxes me, uh, quite frankly, uh, about why. And if you look at the national data and disproportionality in terms of racial disproportionality of students identified in the areas of intellectual disability, or in the areas of emotional and behavioral disturbance, those are also racially disproportionate. So that means that the students that are generally most often segregated in these uh, by disability are also going to be disproportionate by race. So by both um, um, social justice lenses, we should be examining and um, questioning why you know questioning the outcomes of this, like. Is this really better for kids? And, and if so, we better have a really strong reason for it. And I sure haven't seen it. I sure haven't seen a better reason in terms of post-school outcomes. I sure haven't seen a better reason in terms of academic gains. I sure haven't seen a better reason in terms of um, social connections. The other thing that we have discovered so um, clearly again and again in our schools is the benefits to everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, to all students and uh, everybody else makes it sound us and them. And I really mean, I don't mean it that way. I mean the benefit uh, comprehensively to all yeah, students yeah, of course. to not have um, adults uh, separating um, and categorizing and saying only some kids can do this or that. That's very different than having students choose, you know, some affinity groups or some opportunities like I want to, you know, be involved in the um, uh, Black Student Union or something like that, or that that's totally different. And you can have a disability uh, club or opportunity where students who can find, find people who might share characteristics, fantastic. If it's student driven, if it's choice driven, great. Make opportunities for that. But to have adults um, segregate students by what they see as deficiencies or a lack of ability to um, engage rather than us making the the entry point for them to find a way to engage, that's just wrong. And, you know, one of the, um, I'll tell you two very quick stories about that. One is early on in this work, we had a, a student that uh, it was maybe the first year in high school that we had students that had been in a life skills class and they had most of those students had a more typical schedule with a lot of support and we're still kind of figuring things out. And I was in an IEP meeting with a student who with an intellectual disability who was part of an economics class. And to be honest, my um, personal goals for him were more social about his involvement in that. I didn't have strong academic goals for that because of my own ableism, right? And so I'm sitting there in this IEP meeting and he's he's in the meeting, he's not saying a lot. And um, the, the adults are talking about him. And <laughs> finally the case, the learning specialist leans over and says, so um, says his name, how, how are you liking the class? And the student, speaks up and I, I didn't, he doesn't have a lot of oral language typically. And he says, well, I sure have learned a lot about supply and demand. And, uh, you know, jaws yeah. were dropped. Yeah. And we were like, okay, yeah. you know, we have to up our expectations here. This yeah. young man at, was absorbing content. Mm -hmm. And who's to say, he does, shouldn't have that opportunity. Um, the other sh story I wanted to share just happened very recently. And this is a little bit about that impact of the entire community. Um, I was out at bus duty the other day. It was uh, you know, a little bit of a chaotic end of the day. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't miss bus duty. I'm going to be honest with you. I miss the principalship from time to time, but I don't miss bus duty. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> um, so end of the day, everybody's getting on the bus and the buses take off. And, and then there are three kids left and two of them are throwing a football with each other. They're fine. And then one kid, I look over, he looks very upset. He's distraught. He's, his hands are in fists. He's very upset. And I look over and I'm thinking, oh, I know this kid. I've known him for years. I, 
I know he's on the spectrum. I know he started off his life in a segregated class in our district, but he's been included for years now. Um, and I see he's distraught, but he, I know him, but he doesn't know me. So I thought, I think I'm just going to hang back and see what he does. And I can help if he needs help, but maybe he doesn't need it. So he walks to the back of the school and there are five kids standing there by the back door. He's very upset, comes up to the door and the kids say, hey, Ronnie, and are you okay? And he said, oh, shoot, I missed my bus, I missed my bus. And they say, oh, that's a bummer. I hate it when that happens, when I do things like that. Are you doing okay? He's like, I'm really upset. And I said, oh, yeah, oh, that's too bad. One of them said, hey, you live kind of near me. The city bus goes near our house. Maybe you should catch the city bus. Another kid said, maybe you should call your parents before you try catching the city bus for the yeah. first time. And another kid says, well, do you know, need to get a phone? And anyway, they helped him with problem solving. And the whole situation was solved with no adults involved at all. Mm. And this moment of him being seen by peers, mm -hmm. not as that, you know, strange kid down the hall that we don't know, mm -hmm. but as someone they've known for years, who's mm -hmm. in and out of their classes, who they understand, who, yeah, interacts a little bit differently in the world. He sure does. But the compassion, the connection, the care, the opportunity, um, because these are the people that are, they're going to be connected in the stores, in the employment, in, in the world. And um, that opportunity to problem solve on both sides. And it, when we think about culture in our schools, we think about bullying, we think mm -hmm. about all the things that we want to build in terms of positive culture, um, a truly supportive, inclusive environment is a baseline of what we should be doing to support that. So I have one last question for you because so overpoweringly, I, I'm gonna try that again. Overpowering for me is, what I'm hearing from you as an underlying theme is you have this huge level of self-awareness because the story with the parent from earlier where you cried together and you said, we're going to work this out. Um, you also said things about questioning. So I want to know because leading, you know, leading for all how to create truly inclusive and excellent schools, that's clearly captured within the book. So your level of self-awareness, your level of, we need to question our beliefs. How does your book help leaders start that journey that you have so clearly gone through? Sorry, I never give a list of questions before I interview people, so I don't mind you taking some time. <laughs> oh, that's a great one. Well, we've, we, we, Try to approach the book in the way and my um, amazing co-author, Dr. Josh, Bloss Josh Blossy, who is now leading this work at an international school in Tanzania. Okay. Um, and uh, he was our assistant director when he was here. Um, anyway, we tried to think about it in the way of if we were brand new to this work, what would be the things we would want to, what would we be wondering? So that's how we wrote it. You know, what would be, what, why would we care about this? So the first couple chapters are about the why, what would be our initial um, moves? What would be some of the instructional frameworks that we would uh, pull, pull from? What would be some of the social, emotional, and behavioral uh, questions and structures that we would pull from. Um, what would be some of the things around uh, communication with key stakeholders? What would be um, some of the um, work with the broader district with operations and hum human resources? Um, and then what might we be looking ahead towards in terms of um, connections with early childhood and um, post high school and college. So those that um, that's that's the way we approached it because I think that's the way our brains work. So our hope is that in this book there might be the it, it's laid out that way so other leaders could dip in and out mm -hmm. to the chapters that are relevant to them if they're just 
thinking about it, maybe dipping in to the why and how it got started might be useful to them. If they're already deep into the why, but they're saying, I want some more of the, of the how and some of the more specifics, they could dip into those chapters. So um, that's how we approached it. And we hope that's of some use to others. And again, um, we're always learning and we love to hear from other folks and districts that are on this journey as well and, and continue to learn from them. Well, I got to tell you, Jennifer Spencer, I'm, uh, I'm really glad that you wrote the book for sure. This was, uh, this brought back lots of memories for me as a, as a teacher and principal, but also it's just so important because it's such a, it's also very frustrating sometimes to be on the side where people are, are not practicing the self-awareness and questioning their practices like you have. So the book is called Leading for All, How to Create Truly Inclusive and Excellent Schools. And thank you so much for being on the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast. Thank you so much. And I just want to say one more quick thing. I wrote it, but it's really, it's such a team effort. It's everyone in our district, all the leaders working together. So you know that uh, it's I, always I, a team sport in education. No, but it's always nice for people to say it too. So thank you. Thank you. So Tanya, I got a little passionate in that one. Mm, yes, you did. But that's good. <laughs> it's honest. It's yeah. authentic. Just uh, I could talk to her for hours because, yeah. you know, when when Jennifer was talking, just there were so many things that came out. And, you know, I tried my every time I moderate a conversation if for the podcast, people need to know I don't walk in with a list of questions. I walk in with one question and then listen. And then it's going to lead me. I know that the guest is going to lead me to yeah. my next question. So they don't have the questions ahead of time. I don't I don't have the questions ahead of time. In this particular case, there were so many times that I actually had a hard time because I know that to be a good moderator, you have to fully listen. So she would say things and I'd be like, oh, I remember that. And they're like, you know, in the back of my, the hair on the back of my neck would stand up and I'm like, I need to ask her about that. And then I thought, no, be present, listen. And it just, there was so much there in the conversation that we needed to be able to talk about, because I don't, I think people need to understand if you're an educator, if you are within a school community, you have to understand how ostracized special ed students can feel. And yeah. you know, what Jennifer's talking about at the core is being more human with everybody and not putting our adult you know, an adult cap on what we think other students can do. And those, that was just, there were so many powerful moments in the conversation that I was, I was just really honored to be able to talk to her. Yeah, her stories are really illuminating. It reminds me of that phrase, you know, the need to put faces on the data because yeah. again, when you hear it from a child's mouth, what their experience is like, it's very hard to unhear that. I, I, I wonder if, uh, leaders listening or whoever should take a moment and shadow the life of a, a special needs child in your building and see what their experience is and see if you find that they are a, they feel included, they're likely to feel included, or if they feel marginalized, are they getting the best education? I mean, just the comments about, you know, who takes attendance for the student and who completes the report card for the student, right? Like if it's othered on the processy side, it's really hard for that not to trickle down to the day-to-day -day interactions for children. So uh, there's just so much here. And if there, we know you can't reflect on everything all the time because it might be stagnating, but I would think there is an area to do it frequently would be what's going on with this, the special needs or the students who are identified as special needs children in your building. Like what, what's their experience? Yeah, because even within the building and outside of the building, I just know from conversations mm -hmm. I've had with parents when I was a principal or when I was a teacher, kids that didn't get invited to birthday parties. So there are some people that, you know, their kids get invited to every birthday party so they don't see it as an issue. And in fact, mm -hmm. they probably complain that their child's got to go to too many birthday parties, but there are kids that don't get invited to birthday parties mm -hmm. just because of a classification that mm -hmm. they may have. Yeah. So this is, you know, what I loved about what Jennifer was saying was just the the human factor that people need to understand. Um, yeah. Those things. So yeah, shadowing is really important, but questioning the practices is great. So thank you yeah. for bringing, and we should thank Jessica, her editor for bringing this one to us because this to me was, it was a really important one too. Yeah, this is a great conversation. So listeners, um, 
we really hope you got as much out of it as we did. Um, tell us about it. Um, yes. <laughs> we definitely want your feedback. Yeah. Um, Peter, it's always such a joy learning with you. I feel like I have pondering to do when I get off mm. this this uh, podcast with you about this topic. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go think, <laughs> yeah, think sure. on this some more. Um, for those of you that don't know, it does happen to be Friday here. It could be Monday, Tuesday, whatever day when you um, are, are listening to this. But Peter, you have a wonderful Friday. Thank <laughs> you, Tanya, you as well. And to everyone, thank you for very li for listening. And Tanya, I love doing this podcast with you. I know. I love doing it with you too. All right, Peter. Bye. Bye. Bye.